<sighs> Take five of this line. Hey everyone, how's it going? Hey everyone, how's it going? Doug here, and we're back with our Let's Read of Archangel. Last time we covered Chapter 4, which introduced us to one of our villains, uh, two of our villains, actually, and had a pretty cool fight scene. So if you're not caught up, I'm going to leave a link below, as always, to the playlist of the Let's Read, so you can go and catch up. Forgive me if my voice is a little scraggly. It's, uh, it's cold and flu season. We're all fighting something. Um, but let's jump into it. We're going into Chapter 5. The red glow of the smothered sun disappeared, and with it, Uriel noticed Chandra's energy. He did not doubt the day had been taxing on her. They had run into a troop of demons that were still high on the blood of their prey. Chandra had tried to fool them at first, explaining that they were on a mission for Botus. It almost worked, but the combination of her eyes and the tattoos that covered Uriel's face were enough to give away what the pair really were. Seeing the two together, a Cambion and an Archangel, confused the demons just long enough for Chandra and Uriel to gain the upper hand. It was relatively easy for the pair to dispatch the small group of beasts, especially when Uriel's first two daggers each found their marks, killing two of the creatures before the fight had even begun in earnest. But what had fascinated the angel the most was how the half-demon fought. The archangel had been too quick to judge his new companion. What he initially believed to be mundane arrows were actually enchanted weapons, created either by the Cambion or her divine mentor. Regardless of who spelled them, the arrows were more than just steel tips on wooden shafts. The arrows bit into the gray, stretched flesh of the demons and consumed them, turning their entire body to ash. The last few demons who already witnessed the devastation of the Cambion's spellworked attacks tried to wrench the arrows from their bodies if they were hit, but even then it was too late. The ravenous magic seemed to work with the first taste of demonic flesh. You performed admirably today, the Archangel said as they sat down in their makeshift camp. It was not much, just the crumbling foundations of an old barn. Still, the stones were sturdy and could provide ample cover during the night. During the day, a harsh wind had shrieked across the barren land, and though it had subsided somewhat, the ruins offered a much-needed reprieve. Those arrows you have are extremely potent. I assume it is some kind of spell work? Cool, aren't they? They can be in turn to grin at him. She pulled a thin blanket out of her bag and set it on the ground. They were a gift from Hadriel. I have memories of my mother getting gifts of clothes and books, but I got a handful of fancy arrows. I've tried copying the runes on them, but it doesn't have the same effect. So I have to be careful with them, you know? Uriel nodded, but their conversation was interrupted by what sounded like a scream. It was far off, though, carried by the strong winds. The angel could not decide whether it was the sound of some beast catching its prey, or a cry of terror from the prey itself. Chandra barely seemed to notice the noise, as if it were as common as the demons they had come across. They only work on demons, though, Chandra continued, sitting on her blanket and rummaging through the small bag in her lap. It's like they can sense them. They are hungry for the damned things. I can't be sure, but I feel like if I stuck myself with one, it would kill me too. The half-demon looked up from her searching and eyed the quiver of arrows uneasily. Though Uriel was looking at them as well, he did not miss the small movement as the Cambion shifted away from the weapons. There was a long break of silence after that. Chandra finally pulled some questionable-looking bread and salted meat out of her bag and gestured them towards Uriel in an offer to join her. The Archangel smiled and shook his head. He would need to eat eventually, but his physical body could withstand a lot more stress than Chandra's. He would wait until they got to Zezerat, where he hoped supplies would be more plentiful, even for an archangel and a half-demon. Can I ask you something? The Cambion's quiet voice suddenly broke their silence. Even with the wind rushing outside their small refuge, it was easy to hear the Cambion, but this tone was different. It was not the same sarcastic demeanor that he had come to expect from the half-demon. If I have the answer, then you shall too. The kindness in his own voice surprised him. Looking into her crimson eyes, the archangel had forgotten for a moment what she was. In his mind, however, there were few better proving grounds than the heat of battle, and Chandra had stood next to him through that already. Perhaps he was willing to give her a chance. Chandra took another bite of bread and swallowed loudly before continuing. Her red eyes no longer met his. All of the memories I received from my mother, everything that the demon in me learned from her, she loved God. The sadness in her voice could not be hidden. He knew why she no longer looked at him. She would literally drop to her knees and worship him, she read all the stories, knew them by heart, the creator, the father, the all-powerful, but how can something be so incredible and let all of this happen? She gestured all around her, as if the crumbling stones around them were her entire world. How could he let everyone, angels and humans, be slaughtered? Uriel sat up straight and gazed at her. There was no fire to speak of, lest they attract any unwanted guests, but he could see her clearly enough. Her body was tense, anticipating an answer that she knew she would not like, no matter what it was. You are mistaken. 
Uriel said with all the gentleness he could. It was a difficult subject for them both, not just for the Cambion. He did not let this happen. It was written, long before you were born, that there would be a great battle between heaven and hell. This prophecy, which we all believe was the word of God himself, claimed that we would be victorious. The world and all of humanity would enter a state of paradise. But we had sinned. Heaven and its angels had become arrogant. We thought that we would simply brush aside Lucifer and his forces. We were so very wrong. My fallen brother and his army climbed out of the depths of hell and decimated our ranks in the initial battles. For every angel there were ten thousand demons, and half that in other terrible creatures, and their bloodlust was second only to the power they had accumulated. You see, angels draw our power from heaven, but heaven's might is only a reflection of the goodness in each soul that our Father has made. Lucifer's forces, on the other hand, are empowered by the opposite. Every sin, every act of senseless horror fuels his legions. The more victories he claimed, the more powerful he became. It was not just the devil who defeated us, but the sins of angel and man. We were no match. Uriel's eyes turned to the sky, as if he expected to see a blanket of stars above them, but he saw nothing, just a darkness as deep and empty as the void of space. No distant stars twinkled before him, no pinpricks of light dazzled him. He had been on both sides of that pitch curtain, but he had not truly known how bleak this planet was until now. Why are you here? Chandra's voice was a welcome reprieve from his thoughts. I am here to push back the darkness. I am here to set things right. No. Her tone took an agitated edge. I mean, why are you here now? Where were you when the war was going on? Why were you safe and sound up in your palace in the sky while those, those things were butchering us? Uriel knew that the half-demon had countless questions for him, but he could not answer them. Some of those questions he had himself. I do not know, he replied, unable to take his eyes from the starless sky. I pleaded to be among the first to descend to earth. I wanted, no, needed, to fight alongside my brothers and sisters. The battlefield is as much a home to me as heaven itself, yet I was stuck in the latter. Our father would not tell me why I had to stay, only that I had no choice. For years I stood sentinel, managing the affairs of heaven and relaying what tactics I could as I watched angels and humans die in immeasurable numbers. That is, until these clouds blinded us. Then yesterday, I was told that it was my time to descend to earth, a decade after this war had begun. My father told me to have faith, that I would return light to the world. Uriel finally tore his eyes from the unending darkness and looked at his companion. Chandra was not returning his gaze, though. She was stroking a strand of her hair and staring at the ground, as if the barren dirt would give her some answers. It was as helpful as the sky had been to the archangel. Then her eyes snapped up to his, a semblance of a smile on her face. Well, don't you worry, choir boy. You have me now. The half-demon yawned and laid down, using her half-empty bag as a makeshift pillow. And Uriel? Yes, he said as the wind around them died down for a moment. Her back was to him. Thank you for what you did to my sister this morning. She's been alone before, but this time feels different. Let's kill that son of a bitch, Bodus, and get back to her quickly, okay? Uriel could not find an answer for the Cambion. Somehow, she managed to be crude and warming all at once. With no fire for the pair, and the wind picking back up, the Archangel noticed that Chandra was shivering. She tried to hide it, as if not wanting to show any weakness to her new ally. Uriel rose from his seat against the stone wall and moved as quietly as he could. There was a soft shuffle as he removed his long coat and lowered it onto Chandra's chilled body. Without a word, he turned and took up a perch among the ruins, keeping watch while the half-demon slept. The Cambion gripped the coat tightly around her. Though she did not want to admit it to herself, Chandra had not felt this safe in a very long time. Something we haven't had to encounter yet is, uh, scene breaks. And I don't know how to indicate that, or what I'm supposed to do. This is what I mean. Right there. So, scene break. (laughs) It'll probably just be a long pause in the future. Chandra was roused from her sleep by the soft touch of the archangel. Her- Oh, I'm in the wrong chair! Oh, there's gonna be so many creaks in this now. Chandra was roused from her sleep by the soft touch of the archangel, her eyes still clouded with the fog of her dreams. Normally she would have woken up at the first glow of the morning, but the mental and physical tolls from the previous day had been taxing on her. She shook off her exhaustion quickly, though, and looked up at Uriel. It is time for us to move, he said in a voice that was a stark contrast to his usual warrior nature. Sorry, the Cambion muttered. The sky was mostly black, though not the darkness that accompanied the night. A red glow was just beginning to form. I don't usually oversleep. 
She glanced around and noticed two figures next to one of the ruined foundations. In a flash, she was up and brandishing the dagger the archangel had given her, all remnants of sleep gone in a blink. Uriel laughed. Do not worry, the angel said, gesturing for the half-demon to calm down. They wandered too close for my liking. I needed to deal with them. It was only then that Chandra noticed that the two figures were corpses of demons, slumped against the weathered stones to hide them from view. One of them had its throat slit, the blood covering its gray, lifeless chest still wet. The other's head hung at an unnatural angle, his neck clearly broken. Scared the shit out of me. Chandra rubbed her eyes with her free hand while she chuckled. Already standing, she turned and rolled up her blanket, stuffed it in her pack, and handed the jacket back to Uriel. She refused to look at him as she did. Thanks, she muttered. Uriel nodded, an action the half-demon only saw out of the corner of her eye. The archangel donned the duster without a word. All set? Chandra asked once her pack was tied. If we get going, and we don't run into any more assholes, then we should get to Zezerat in half a day. Uriel nodded once again. He tried to hide the combination of anxiety and excitement that he felt. This was his mission, his very purpose. As the pair walked back towards the dry creek bed that marked their way, Uriel silently thanked the half-demon for helping him fulfill that purpose. True to her word, Uriel spotted the silhouette of the city within a few hours, a jagged shadow on the dim horizon. The number of demons they saw seemed to increase in folds the closer they got to their destination, but Chandra knew the path well and was able to navigate their way without the two being seen. When Zezerat was just another hour or so away, Chandra called their march to a halt. They managed to find a copse of trees that provided them cover from the red glow, but could do little against the heat that permeated the new world. Please, save it for yourself. Yariel said, declining the food that Chandra offered. I will eat once food is a little less scarce. Suit yourself. Did she say suit yourself before? No, she didn't. She didn't say anything. She smiled. Suit yourself. The half-demon shrugged and popped the last bit of dried meat in her mouth. Yariel took the brief rest they had to remove his jacket. The wind from the previous day was gone, which Yariel was somewhat thankful for. It made the air almost unbearably stale and warm. He could feel his brow beaded with sweat after the morning's travels, but no wind meant that his scent would not travel or give them away. The scent of an angel was euphoric to some creatures, like the hellhounds he had encountered before. This close to the city, Uriel did not want to attract any undue attention. Feeling the heat? Chandra quipped. I'm sure the weather is nicer in heaven, but you're going to have to keep yourself covered. Those tattoos are too obvious. You'd be noticed the first time a demon looked at you. She was right. The archangel knew. He could not afford the creature comforts of heaven or even the old earth. One misstep in his mission would be over. He would be over. With reluctance, Uriel put his duster on once more. Let us continue, he said, falling in line behind the cambion. As they moved closer to the metropolis, Uriel noticed that the entire place was walled in. It was more like a massive fortress than any kind of modern city. At the base of the walls were giant shards of jagged rock that pointed outwards like daggers. At first, the angel thought that they might be some sort of defense. Then it dawned on him that this was not a city of earth, but one that had been pulled from the depths of hell itself. Somehow, Bodus had raised his own infernal kingdom from the bowels of the underworld. The walls were sleek, glistening mirrors of black rock, streaked with veins of brilliant gold. Smoke billowed from within the city and from fissures outside of it, too. On one side of the city was a massive chasm, the hot air shimmering above it as if a raging fire burned below. Above that chasm was a large drainage pipe, its fluid pouring into the chasm and out of sight. That's three chasms in two sentences. Oh, Doug. Thankfully, the journey to the walls of Zezerat was fairly easy. Though there were several roads that funneled to the main gates, the area surrounding the city was littered with massive boulders and other debris that should have been underground. Uriel assumed that it had been flung aside when the city erupted from hell, and had simply been ignored since. Bodis, the archangel knew, was a brilliant tactician, but was lazy and arrogant. His faults were now their blessing as the pair used boulders and fallen trees as cover. It was slow, but methodical. When he got the chance, Uriel glanced at the main gates of Zezerat. He had not expected the demon lords to be so... civilized. The angel had expected this new earth to be filled with constant warring factions of demons. Now that the angels and humans had been annihilated, they had only each other to fight. But the figures moving through the gates of Zezerat, both in and out, were not just demons. Among the other dark, sentient beings of the underworld, Uriel could see humans moving freely as well. They looked broken, like shells of what he knew humans to be, but they were alive. Alright, pay attention and stay right behind me. 
Chandra's order snapped the archangel out of his observations. If you don't, it's not a fun fall. They had reached the edge of the chasm where the drain spilled out. A terrible stench accompanied an even greater heat, threatening to burn the angel's skin as well as his nose. Uriel glanced over the edge. The pit was deep, with its walls a series of vicious, fang-like rocks and its base a glowing river of lava. Any waste that was poured into the chasm merely burned up when it hit the molten rock, filling the air with a thick, noxious gas. It would have been a rather efficient system if it didn't poison the air around it. Not even his father would know what it had done to the inhabitants of the city so far. Quick interjection. It's been pointed out to me multiple times that people really like the idea of a river of lava working into waste management, which I think is hilarious. Like, it was just kind of thrown in as an aside so that there was, you know, this this kind of cool lava, like, hellish feature uh, to the city. But it's been a real sticking point for a lot of people, like a real, a real appreciation. So back to the story. Without another word, Chandra reached out over the chasm and gripped onto the foundation of the city's wall. Unlike the rest of the walls, the jagged rocks of the chasm extended to a few meters above the drain pipe. With a keen crimson eye, Chandra found some handholds in the ebony wall. Her grip secured. The Cambian moved her foot out above the lava pit, then lifted the rest of her body after it. She was nimble and scaled the uneven surface quickly, confidently. Trusting his new ally, Uriel followed her, grabbing each protruding rock and stepping in each crack that she did, shadowing her every move. One false step, one misplaced hold, and every demon in the city would flock to the sight of his wings. Every rock that crumbled and fell away from the wall was a stark reminder of what the alternative to flying was. The climb was short. It was only a moment or two before Chandra was on top of the drainpipe, keeping low to avoid any eyes that might glance their way. Uriel quickly joined her and knelt next to the edge of the pipe. Without a word, he offered the half-demon his hand. What a gentleman, Chandra said with a sark. Gripping her forearm, Uriel supported his companion as she lowered herself in front of the open pipe. He slowly swung her back and forth, gaining momentum each time. When he felt her grip loosen, he let his own do the same. He heard the half-demon's foot land with a splash, the kind one might hear if they had jumped in the muddy shallows of a swamp. The angel spun himself over the edge of the drain, using his own momentum to duplicate the swing. Shit, Chandra muttered when he landed in the dirty, flowing water. Literally. The archangel tried not to think about it as he joined her farther in the sewers, finding a raised path that gave him some reprieve from the waste. Down the tunnel, he could see some dull, flickering lights incrementally lined along the wall. Apparently, the city had electricity, but the angel did not know how far that grid extended. He was thankful, though. The dim red light of the world seemed to be as repulsed by the sewage as the archangel and half-demon were. It was dark in the sewers, limiting even his vision. The lights along the wall provided pockets of illumination, but there were still stretches of shadows between them. Thankfully, Chandra led the way through the winding tunnels, confident in what Uriel only saw as a maze. I know someone in the city, Chandra explained as they walked. We can crash at his place until you figure out... Fuck! The Cambian jumped back in fright. Uriel quickly shoved past her with a dagger in hand, ready to take on whatever threat might be down here. He saw what had startled Chandra, but it was no threat. There, slumped against the wall, was a man in tattered clothing. Uriel did not know whether the man was alive or dead, but he had not reacted to the half-demon's cry or the sight of a blade. Crouching down to examine the body, Uriel could see his face was yellowed and rotting. To the angel's horror, a hole was in his cheek. Uriel was certain that, had the lighting been better, he could have seen right into the man's mouth through that hole. His arms were limp, his skin loose and barely clinging to gaunt limbs. What is this? Uriel could barely force the words out of his mouth. Plague, Chandra said. She coughed at the stench of the rotting body, an odor somehow more powerful than the streams of waste running all around them. Some strain of it, at least. In the city, it's pretty common, and a lot of time, people will come down here to die. It seems to affect only humans, though. Demons never get it, and I've never contracted anything. I figure angels should be pretty safe, too. The body suddenly shifted, and a noise, unintelligible, came from its mouth. Shit, is it still alive? Chandra took a few steps back. It appears so. Uriel could not fathom the agony the man must have been in. I will try and heal him, he said resolutely. Don't bother. The half-demon had put a hand on his shoulder to stop him. Even if you could, he's so far gone that it would take a lot of juice. So much that your new rune wouldn't be able to hide it. Do you really want to use that kind of power underneath a city full of demons? 
Uriel knew that his companion was right. With the man in this state of decomposition, Uriel did not know if he was a skilled enough healer to help him anyway. There was a difference between having the power to do something and knowing how to do it, and Uriel was not sure he had either in his current state. We have to do something. Chandra walked past the angel, her dagger drawn. The half-demon pulled the man's head away from the wall, leaving behind clumps of rotted skin sticking to the stone, and drove her blade into the back of his skull. The weapon went in easily, the flesh and bone already softened by the disease. Uriel closed his eyes and whispered a word in the tongue of angels, wishing the soul a safe journey to heaven. He tried not to think that, with the black curtain looming overhead, it might never reach there. We are wasting time, Chandra said as she wiped her blade clean on the man's tattered shirt. Let's go. She dragged her hand along the sewer wall as she walked, leaving behind a piece of the man's skull. They hardly made any ground before Uriel heard shuffling up ahead. The desolate tunnels would carry sound from far away, but this was different. It was close. Worse, the archangel felt something masked, something shrouded from his senses. He reached forward and grabbed Chandra's arm to stop her advance. What? But the angel's hand snapped up to cover her mouth. She nodded slowly in understanding while stepping back behind him. Whatever made the noise was hiding just ahead of them in one of the streaks of shadow. He considered using his light to illuminate the tunnel, but thought perhaps the presence in front of them might not be able to see them either. The archangel took another couple of steps, motioning for Chandra to remain where she was. Don't make another move, came a gruff voice from the darkness. Turn around now and go back to wherever you came from, and I promise I won't kill you both. Whoever, or whatever, it was could see them. That put the pair at a distinct disadvantage. I cannot do that, the archangel replied, nor am I intimidated by your threats. There was a metallic click from within the darkness. He has a gun, Chandra whispered. Uriel paused. He could handle most threats, but blindly rushing someone with a gun could not end well, even for him. Still, the archangel refused to be intimidated. In a flourish, Uriel pulled on the golden grip of his sword. The weapon slid easily from its scabbard, its blade erupting in brilliant white flames as it was freed. The divine light reflected off the golden guard in a dance of deadly beauty. The weapon, a manifestation of Uriel's fire, defied anyone who would threaten them. There was a long period of silence, the gunman not making a sound until he spoke with a voice filled with realization. That sword. It can't be. It was not just realization in his voice. It was joy. Brother? Uriel, is that you? I know it's not a big deal, but sometimes I'll read the last sentence in chapters and just kind of get the chills. And people have commented that they really enjoy some of the last sentences in chapters, and I actually put a lot of effort into those final or into that final line to leave a lasting impact and really make someone want to read more. I want to read more. I know what happens. Anyway, that was chapter... I shouldn't smack the desk when there's a mic attached to it. So that concludes chapter five of Archangel. And this chapter, though not nearly as action-packed as the previous one, was a very important one. We saw some background to the apocalypse or at least Chandra's interpretation of it, and we got a better understanding of her character. And the more we get to know her, the more we can understand that, though she's half-demon, she's not necessarily bad, like she's not innately evil. Um, in addition to that, we got to understand a little bit more of the lore of the world. We got that lava sewage waste management, so you're welcome to whoever likes that. Probably most importantly, we saw some of the plague that's affecting the world in the man that Chandra had to kill there. And that scene was a really interesting one to me, not just because I got to, you know, amplify the darkness of the story, but it really shows some development in that there is this woman who has been brought up in a world where it's normal to just put someone out of their misery like that. In this kind of world, people don't think twice about it. He will go down to the sewers to die, and what she did she considers a mercy, even though to Uriel it's abhorrent. But beyond that, I can't speak much more without giving away spoilers. Who is it that Chandra and Uriel came upon? Um, and where are they going to go from here? Anyway, I want to say thank you to my Patreon subscribers. I'm going to pop them up in the corner there. There. That's a better corner. 
Um, and thank you to everyone for listening. Again, there is a link to the playlist for the entire Let's Read series down below. I'm going to leave links to where you can get three free short stories, uh, visit my website, and a link to buy Archangel if you want a copy for yourself. Anyway, thanks for stopping by, thanks for listening, and I'll see you later.